Okay. Okay, okay. And you guys can see my screen okay? Yep. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, so um, obviously different areas of the world have different potential drought risk and different relative amounts of scarce fresh water availability. Now we, we typically think of this as uh, as you know, California is being an epicenter, a hot spot, and of course it is. Of course, we're we're constantly dealing with drought. It seems like all the time here. Um, but um, as bad as we have it, if you look across the globe here, you can see um, some areas are actually uh, uh, even much much worse than we uh, have it. Again, this is um, both because of the environmental or, or the, the um, uh, hydrological availability of water and our demands and how much we need in terms of the human population, industry, et cetera, in those areas. So um, where do you guys see the greatest uh, challenge here, uh, globally speaking? In Asia or India. Mm -hmm. Yeah, particularly South. I mean, so, so definitely there's some uh, uh, sort of in uh, above the Black Sea in those areas, but but really the the big huge one that stands out is that sort of Southeast Asia, India, that that the Indian subcontinent, huge problematic. Again, um, uh, there's de there's definitely challenging areas all around Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, um, you know, it goes on, but. But uh, one of the issues uh, that, again, is, is adding to this stress is not just the availability, but the population um, that is there and the um, redundancy. So if we had a, a modern water delivery system and one component would break down, we maybe could, could fall back on some kind of redundancy or some alternative supply. But in many of these uh, areas, they don't have that, um, as bad as our infrastructure here is, in California, um, it's 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 so much better than what many of the much of the planet has, and so this is one of the uh, key drivers of concern with regards to so-called um, uh, climate refugees, right? And so, uh, while we can get climate refugees from any aspect of um, global weirding, as I like to call it, instead of global warming, global weirding. Um, but uh, drought is one of those ones in particular that seems to be um, increasingly problematic. So drought was a key feature um, in uh, Tun Tunisia and the northern parts of Africa that um, helped spark the Arab Spring. Um, uh, crop failures because of drought, et cetera, was a key stoker of um, the most recent round of instability in Syria that led to the Syrian uh, civil war and all the massive amounts of refugees and all this and that. So, so drought is a huge um, pusher of buttons, as it were, in terms of um, people needing to move or being forced to move um, or, or having um, their livelihoods changed, having to migrate either inside a country or outside of a country, et cetera. So um, this is something we, we definitely need to pay attention to, even if we're not an environmental scientist per se. Um, because this is having the, the drought risk in particular is having huge ramifications in terms of the global order and um, economics and human rights and all of those things wrapped up together. Um, now we had, so our, our greatest environmental disaster probably, this, this is an interesting question. This is the kind of thing where you have some beers and debate and you can get uh, uh, all kinds of different arguments, but I think it's pretty clear that if it's not the worst environmental disaster we've had in the United States in modern times, it is certainly very close to it. Um, and that is the Dust Bowl. So this was in uh, you know, the early days of the Great Depression, um, the so-called dirty 30s. 
um, and was centered in the Midwest, centered at the Texas Panhandle, Oklahoma, that, that region of uh, the country, um, started, as with so many of our disasters, started with some bad management decisions, some poor, uh, poorly informed decisions. Essentially, um, people came from, European settlers came to the prairie, to that area that had not traditionally received tillage or, or agriculture. People came in, tweaked that landscape, uh, started tilling it up, et cetera, and made the soil vulnerable to soil erosion. And, uh, and so sort of set the stage for a problem. And then when we had the environmental stressor come along, which was um, drought, um, we saw massive failure of the food production system. Um, and so this is where we get the term uh, uh, Okies, people from Oklahoma coming to California. This is where the, this is the, the subject of the grapes of wrath and, and, and the fodder for grapes of wrath and all of that stuff. And essentially the abandonment, wholesale abandonment of, of chunks of the country, um, uh, sort of overnight, not exactly overnight, but in a very short period of time. Um, so we have a combination of poor um, land use practices merged with drought and intense storms that led to these huge, um, and so you see a picture right there on the right, you see this huge, um, massive uh, uh, soil, you know, dirt has become um, airborne, essentially. And we see these so-called black blizzards that would come along, and this is essentially something you might think you'd see in the desert, you know, a, a, a one of these desert sandstorms, but this is um, in an area that used to be vegetated, right, used to be covered with grass and buffalo roaming around and all that kind of stuff, um, but because we changed the ecological functioning, um, when we had these drought stressors that this reduced rainfall, we didn't have the ability to hold the soil in place, and then once we started down this route, it was a positive feedback loop. Once some chunks of the soil surface started to rip up and blow away, others started to blow away, and it was this huge positive feedback loop. And so this uh, starts in the early 30s and goes on and on and on, and it really takes a concerted effort by the federal government and entities like the Calif uh, like California, like the um, uh, Conservation Corps um, and Works Project Authority and these different entities to go around and essentially um, uh, use brute force to try to restore some of these areas with plantings, with um, uh, very specific soil um, uh, holding procedures that started the, the USDA and the Soil Conservation Service was started in the wake of, of these giant sandstorms, et cetera. So this was a horrible, horrible thing. On the order of about um, 100 million acres of farmland was abandoned. Tens and tens and tens of thousands of families just uprooted, moved to the West or, or other parts of the country um, and became essentially migrant uh, farmers uh, in the, the, the grape fields, in the lettuce fields, et cetera, in California. So we've done this before. We've, we've made bad decisions and drought has come along and, and thrown gasoline on the fire as it were. <clears throat> when we do have uh, drought, um, well, let me just say it this way. So there's, there's almost every year, there's usually a drought somewhere in the US. We're a relatively large country. We span a wide range of climatological uh, schema and, and the like. And so usually there's somewhere where we're having some kind of drought um, on any one year. Generally speaking, the most spatially ex extensive droughts are the ones that are the driest. So according to this guy, according to this figure here, so on the left, we have how much of the, the US is in a drought state. On the x-axis, as we go to the left, that's gonna be an indicator of, of um, drought or, or drier. And <clears throat> this is our, um, our sort of default national drought index um, on the x-axis here. And as we get drier and drier, it tends to have impact larger and larger swaths of the country. We can measure uh, conditions, obviously right now, by sticking a probe in the soil or by um, putting a rain gauge up and, and getting a sense of what the rainfall is. And that's great and that's very useful and we do that. 
Um, but obviously we've only had rain gauges for a certain amount of time and we've only had um, rain gauges in a certain location for a certain number of years. So we immediately come up to the problem of, well, what is normal, right? What is, what is the, the correct background rate of rainfall or, or, or snowfall or whatever the precipitation measurement is? And um, we, we quickly find that our direct measurements of uh, climate of rainfall of water availability um, fall short. And so what we've done is turn to other measurements that we can um, get a longer cast back in time so we can have a better sense of what the variability is in terms of rainfall, et cetera. And the um, uh, best one, if we're talking about uh, you know, general US is gonna be um, our tree ring data. And so um, what we've done here is we've gone in and we've cored some trees. And as you can see this tree around us, so we've, we've right cut the tree down and we're looking at a cross section of the tree. Um, we see these tree rings. And what we see is alternating bands of light and dark. Uh, dark is gonna be a, a dense concentration of cells. Um, uh, the lighter color is gonna be a less dense packing of cells. And so generally speaking, how we interpret that is the uh, light color is a period of rapid growth. So the light color is a period of relative high water availability. The dark period is a relative period of slow growth. And so cells are being laid down closer to each other and, and they're not uh, expanding as much in any one um, period or any one day or week or whatever. And so um, uh, what, we're, what we see in, in places like, um, uh, temperate regions like North America, um, we see a clear signal of seasonality. And so we see a clear winter time and summer time or, or wet time and dry time or ideal time to grow and time where it's harder to grow for these um, plants. And so what we're seeing is the annual record um, of growth laid down in these trees. So we can take a, we can either cut a tree down or we can just take a really rigid straw, a metal straw, and essentially drill that into the heart, to the center of the tree, pull it out, and then have, and then capture the, this banding. And then uh, by using some more sophisticated techniques, things like fire scars, things like uh, uh, isotopic uh, uh, radiocarbon dating and things of that nature, and we can start to get a sense of how, um, you know, what what the what, what the conditions were like for this tree five years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. We start to get to lo long lived trees. We can go back hundreds of years. In some cases, we can go back uh, you know, th more than a thousand years. Um, but then that tree, or, so we can only go back you know, a certain number of hundreds or thousands of years, depending on what region or, or, or plant or tree species we're talking about. But then we have trees that sometimes fall over and die. And we can, we can crosswalk those. So we can actually start to go back in a, pr a pretty amazingly uh, robust record through time by using both living and deceased tree rings by sort of aligning up th those growth rates um, with lots of individuals. And so what we see here in this case, this is looking at, at uh, water uh, availability um, and uh, looking at different uh, years back in time. Uh, and the tree ring data is in blue. And from that, with, with some various estimations, dendrochronology, folks that study this are dendrochronologists, uh, we can um, extrapolate what the water um, availability was like in, say, the, the adjacent rivers, et cetera. <clears throat> and uh, in many cases, these tree rings, because trees are much more spatially laid out in, in a much higher density than are typically our our instruments measuring uh, conditions like uh, temperature and water availability, et cetera. And so it, it turns out the tree rings can actually capture a, a, a decent amount of spatial variability. So the top graph here is our instruments, um, you know, the, the, the scientific instruments that we're using. And what we've done here is we've kriegd this. So we've, we've created um, a sort of the best fit blob, if you will, to our data. But by definition, because our instruments are less numerous than the trees, these blobs are more generic. These blobs are less specific. When we have things like trees and a higher sample size, 
um, both in terms of space and in terms of time, we can create much finer, we potentially can create much finer scale maps of uh, environmental conditions. And so even though I think people tend to think of uh, scientific instruments as, as the better indicator, in some cases, um, actually tree rings are a superior uh, instrument. The reality is we use both and, and, and both are helpful and, and uh, constructive. Um, yeah, and so again, why do we need to go use these funky techniques to try to kind cast what the situation was? Because we things just didn't go back that far. So here we go. This is, we're looking at um, the uh, Colorado River Basin. The Colorado River stretches across seven different states and the, the Colorado River and it flows into Mexico. Very, so the Colorado River is not the heaviest flowing river or anything like that um, in North America or whatever. Um, but it is the most litigated river. It is the river that we fight over the most. And so um, it is certainly um, a, a point of contention in terms of drought management and all this and that. So if we look at Lee's Ferry, which is, which is in the Colorado um, drainage, um, what we see is, uh, okay, so, so here we go. We have this yellow line, okay? And this is uh, annual rainfall uh, over various years. And what we see here is in recent years, by and large, things are blue, meaning we're, we're relatively wet, right? <clears throat> when we start to go back in time though, um, yes, we absolutely have some blue periods, some blue years, but the red um, starts to jump out much more to us, right? So the, the, these periods of low rainfall, these periods of low water availability. And so these correspond to, uh, times when um, the Anasazi and, and, and different uh, people in the area uh, experienced um, collapse of their civilizations. Um, this uh, is time of great upheaval in terms of the going on of these systems. And this is the normal, right? So this is the normal. So all of our policy, all of our infrastructure, all of our roads, all of our water distribution networks, et cetera, have essentially grown up in this blue phase. And if we only used our, our recent data, we would say, ah, oh, this is a smart thing to do. Our water systems are great. But as we see, even not even talking about climate change, right, really yet, just talking about natural variation before we started mucking with the system, already we have, um, we are already missing a large portion of the variation here. And that's again, another uh, common theme in a lot of our disaster, um, uh, topics and a lot of our disaster challenges. And these anomalies, these, these deviations from the quote unquote norm have huge impact or potentially have huge impacts um, on uh, the society, on, on things that are, that are going on. And um, this is the norm. So strong deviations are not are not um, an occasional thing that might happen once every 500 years or whatever. These are um, constant challenges. So have a look at this. So this is, um, again, this is, this is the, the drought index here. So the negative number is going to be uh, the drier. The positive number is going to be the wetter or, or the, the unusually uh, moist time, or you can think of it as, as heavy flows in the river. Um, and and anything anything jump out at you guys about this figure here, this this sort of figure over time. Um, I guess for me, I just, I mean, I know that we're like a dry place, but I just didn't realize like how how droughts have just always like major droughts have just always been a thing here, and I think just right now, people drive home like oh like we're dry, we're dry. Like this is the first time it's ever happened, but yeah. no, like it's been happening all of history. So totally. that's interesting. Totally. Yeah, good. No, that's good, Caitlin. Any, anybody else? And like, according to this chart, like it doesn't even look that bad. Like I, I know it goes up to like 2000, but like up compared to like the other things, I'm not saying it's not, but you know. Okay, cool, cool. Any other, any other thoughts about this 
figure anything else sort of stick out to people? How it's, um, how would I say, uh, how it's been increasing from both ends. Um, it seems like the scale has just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger compared to earlier on. And it's, it's just kind of weird just looking at it, how it's rising more and more. Yeah, so certainly like, like okay, so if we, if we start in like the 50s or so, um, we had some droughts and then it, it sort of boom peaks, right? So there's, so to me, uh what strikes me is the noise here right if we if we threw up a graph of temperature it's going to be much more uh smooth i guess i would say right this sucker is really really noisy it's up down up down up down up down you know what i'm saying so yeah, if, yeah. if i said if i said what's the average here right uh, so, or so how many times do you guys hear that, right? Was, oh, the average rainfall, average rainfall for February, average rainfall for January, average rainfall for December, right? We hear that a lot in the in the weather forecasters or or the, you know that kind of stuff. You guys with me on that one? Yeah. Yeah. What the hell does average mean here? <laughs> right. So we have one year super wet. Yeah. One year, super dry. Of course, you and I can take, you know, a, 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 I don't know, a 30 and a minus 10, right? And average those together and come out with a, uh, you know, I don't know, a, a 20 or whatever, whatever it would be, right? But just because we can average a high and a low, doesn't mean that we are typically at the average, right? We're almost never are we at the average, right? So in this case, so the average, so th this case, not not drought, not super wet, not super dry, would be at that zero, right? Would be at the at the um, at at the sort of black line running through the middle of the graph. You guys with me on that one? Yeah. And so so we look at that. There's almost no years when it's like that, right? It's always up, or almost always at least, up into the blue or down in the red. So um, yeah, mathematically, we can calculate an average, you know, a geometric average. But does that really mean anything, right? So this is, this is similar to saying, um, let's see. Uh, so we have a, maybe you guys go to a high school reunion or something. And uh, you guys, you guys are too young to go to high school reunions. What am I saying? But uh, but anyway, so let's let's pretend. Let's pretend you're an old dude like me, and you go to high school reunion. Um, and uh, maybe you have a bunch of uh, your your fellow students, your former friends, or whatever, that um, make just you know minimum wage jobs and they're making you know fifty thousand dollars a year or something like that right but then you have a couple of folks that went on and became whatever movie stars or nba stars or whatever the heck it was right and so those folks are making i don't know million bucks five million bucks a year or something like that right so if we took most people's fifty thousand dollar a year salary and then added some of these you know folks that are making $5 million a year, all of a sudden the average salary of your, uh, the average you know, household income of your fellow students is hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. But the reality is it's not. It, th th there's very little in that median, in that middle area, it's on the extremes. And so that, that's the problem with saying average rainfall, right? And so, um, uh, we need to be really clear when we talk about environmental data, we talk about data in general, but in terms of these environmental um, uh, data, we have to make sure we understand the distribution of the data. Firstly, you know, the extremes, of course, the extremes, and it's not wrong to calculate an average, but if we then use that average, 
if that average then creeps into our weather forecasts, right? If that average then creeps into our, our assessment of what is normal, that does become a problem, right? And so um, it's, it's not normal for us to have a regular year in California. It's normal for us to have a crazy wet year and a crazy dry year. And more typically, a crazy wet year and then several years of crazy dry and then a wet year and then several years of crazy dry and then a wet year, right? And so if you think about that, our planning for um, uh, uh, what plants you want, want to plant in your garden, uh, what food crops the, the farmers might want to plant, that's very different um, from thinking of it that way, the real way, as opposed to the average, right? The, the, the illusion of, of central tendency in that case. Is that cool? Does that make sense? So be yeah, wary when people say average rainfall or, or, or whatever. You, much better to talk about records. Do we exceed the record? Do we exceed the record high, record low? Um, or to talk about the median um, value on, the, on this day um, kind of thing. But, but be very careful when they just toss out the average or the mean. Um, OK, and then I'll just say that, uh, yeah, um, not only do we have different supply uh, or different rainfall in these different areas, we also have different consumption rates in these areas. And, um, and in our hot, dry desert areas, we um, go through a lot of water. Um, yeah, so we already talked about this. Okay, so then, so this, this is what I just mentioned, but this notion of normal, what is normal in California? Here is a figure from um, a couple of years ago, but I like it. Uh, and so this is showing us um, from essentially uh, 1895 to um, a couple of years ago. And here we're looking at drought, okay? So let me zoom in a little bit here so it's a little bit bigger. Um, okay, so now, uh, again, this is a, a, a drought index. So as we go high up or as we go up on the uh, y-axis, that is going to be um, wetter years. As we, um, and, and the zero would be not uh, wet or dry. And then as we go low into the negative numbers here, that would be drought conditions. And the farther we, we go down, um, the more intense either the rainfall or the lack of rainfall is. Okay, and so uh, this is uh, a great example. Okay, so here we go. So here we, ha we have all these data points. So e each year is a circle or a, or a point. And then the deviation from, the, from zero is what the lines are showing you, right? And uh, so a line is a, is a, if we have a, a solid line there, so, so all, the, all the points are, all the points there that are there. But the ones that are showing intense deviation are the ones that are fully colored, okay? So the ones that are closer, that are just a little bit dry or just a little bit wet, those ones are, are slightly grayed out. Um, so the ones we're talking about in terms of uh, intense are the ones that are uh, deeply colored, fully colored. And then to illustrate that further, there's been a line that's a black line that's joined that particular point down to the uh, zero, and so uh, we can look at this. And um, as we as we start off on, on for the last you know century or so, um, yes, we always have some years that are up and some years that are down, right? We always have, and if, if particularly if we look at the moist, dry area, the the light colors, yes, there's lots of dots in the dry-ish and lots of dots in the wet-ish. Um, but if we talk about the extremes, the deviations, we're starting to see um, more black lines as we go to the right. You guys see that? Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, uh, we're, when it is getting wet, it's getting wetter. And when it is getting dry, it's getting drier. But the thing that's dominated for the last um, a decade or so uh, really is this drought, really is this deviation to the, in this case, uh, lower on the axis. And then these, these uh, lines here, these, these uh, red, green, um, uh, um, orange, these are different model fits for uh, the deviation. And what, what you see is um, we start relatively moist, 
and there's some meandering, et cetera. But as we get to the early teens, the early 20 teens, um, we're, we're tending to be in this drought condition. And so um, our models are suggesting that we're getting more into this condition. Now, if we just had our regular rainfall and we had some magic thing that could catch the rainfall, it wouldn't be quite as bad. But again, because California, our water system is designed to capture frozen water in the form of snow and ice in the Sierras, and then slowly over many months, uh, that melting um, snowpack uh, goes into our rivers, goes into our water distribution system, goes into our reservoirs, and then comes to us. As we have these you know, bigger chunks of water coming through and deeper droughts, the system was not designed for that. So we're even, even if we had, um, you could imagine the same quantity of water that fell as compared to a couple of years ago, um, but now it's falling more quickly, more intensely. It's warmer. It's not as cold. By definition, the system cannot, we cannot utilize that water as efficiently. And so we're getting into these um, huge problems here with this variation. So a key part of our challenging of our challenge in droughts in California and other arid areas around the world is this variability. I think that's what I want to say. Make sense? Questions? Questions, anybody? No, all right. I wowed you all. Okay, how do I pause this guy? How do I pause this? It seems like my um, controls continually change here on Zoom for some strange reason. 